Good morning, uh, dear colleagues. If I could ask you to take your your places uh, and uh, those who would like to be able to follow every word, you can also take air phone phones. There is a translation provided from French into English and Latvian. Donc, euh, mesdames et messieurs, chers collègues, euh, le moment est venu pour euh, le discours de clôture de notre... Un, un moment un peu triste. <laughs> um, mais avant que... So we'll have a final uh, presentation, which is a slightly uh, sad moment. So let me introduce you to our special guest from Essil, representing Essil. So, let me make two specific remarks about the next speaker. Debate and discussion that we have had over the last two days in scope of our conference has primarily focused on a concept or a notion mentioned in his address by Judge Crawford or the national dimension of the international law. So we talked about the crisis, we talked about the rights, uh, international a law and domestic law, not national law, and of course we have to recognize that there is a national and international dimension to the international law, which has become very apparent uh, lately, especially in Europe. We who have an international perspective on various issues, who keep themselves up to date with developments in the world, we can now see that there are some concerning the phenomena that can be observed, uh, we can see that international uh, law and legal instruments uh, basically are applied across uh, the borders and therefore it's my pleasure to introduce to you our special friend representing ESIL, the uh, Vice President of the Council of uh, National Council of France, uh, Mr. Jean-Marc Sauvet. The role of the Council of the State is to develop a legal framework that enables to resolve uh, various clashing notions or dimensions such as national and international dimension of the international law, the European Court of Human Rights and the European Court of Justice have benefited greatly from the support and the advice provided by uh, Mr. Sauvé. Uh, he's a friend of the uh, legal practitioners of all the Europe, he's been the president of the uh, council since 2006, and he's also uh, been taken part in drafting of the Treaty on the European Union. He's also developed various education programs for the French judges, including Supreme Court justices, and he's also the head of uh, the uh, European Administrative Justice uh, Council and also the president of the Council of the State. After graduating from the uh, administration school in France, he'd worked uh, very closely with uh, the Minister of Justice and has been actively involved in different projects implemented by the Ministry for Interior and uh, Ministry 
of Justice. Uh, he's been also the Secretary General of the French government. So now it's my pleasure to turn the floor uh, to our esteemed guest. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Justice. Uh, thank you, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you for the kind words uh, that you gave in the introduction. It's an honor for me to be here and give the, the final speech at the 12th Annual Conference of uh, ESIL. I would like to specifically thank the President uh, of the ASIL, as well as the uh, President of the Latvian Constitutional Court. I would like to thank all the organizers who put together this wonderful event, and especially Latvian public uh, authorities who were so kind as to host this conference. would like to especially uh, thank the uh, Constitutional Court and the Riga Graduate School of Law. This conference has gathered or brought together experts uh, of different fields of uh, international law. And we discussed during these days at conference different fundamental issues of international law. So we talked about the role of international law in times of crisis or how it works in times of crisis. This has become a very important problem nowadays, especially given that there are different crises that we are facing. We are facing migration crisis, security crisis. We also may expect similar crisis to happen also in other areas and sectors. So we must be able to deal with the crisis efficiently. And what comes to my mind in this regard is Paul Ricoeur's uh, quote, who in 1986 gave a speech about the crises of modern societies. He mentioned in his speech that crisis means basically a transition or the end of the transition from one form of civilization or from one level of civilization to another. And these crises are basically the demarcation lines between various periods of time in the history of civilization when uh, some uh, critical decisions have to be made. And the crisis can not only be uh, a destructive uh, force, the crisis may also have its advantages as well. Uh, a crisis is a sort of a window of opportunity between the absolute devastation or a breakdown of the previous system and its reemergence into a new uh, system. If we look back uh, in time and with uh, eyes of politicians and eyes of lawyers, and if we refer to the Enlightenment philosophers who uh, said that crisis is a certain progress, then we can also address some of the more traditional uh, models proposed by Paul Ricoeur. In our age, uh, crisis and fear is not just a passing period. It has become a permanent uh, phenomena uh, in our times, which lead to uncertainty. And it's not clear how those crises have emerged, what has caused them, and how to solve them. That's why we can't talk about uh, a clear distinction between the crisis and post-crisis uh, period, because what we can see these days is crisis that basically never ends, that continues uh, for limitlessly uh, from uh, the perspective of uh, time. So I would So we therefore can't 
identify all the different dimensions of a crisis and address uh, those multiple sides of the crisis in an, an integrated or targeted manner. That's why we don't have a natural cure to them. And there is a social, economic, and political dimension to the crisis. So I will talk about, uh, therefore, the traditional uh, crisis-solving methods as a rather obstacle in solving the modern-day crisis. I would like to show you how we can deal with the current crises based on our professional experience uh, rather than traditional approaches. So we are living in an age where there are, we can see series of crises, sectorial and regional crises. And those crises have a global and systemic uh, are systemic in, in nature. So there's a great diversity of uh, crises. There are a series of exogenous shocks as well as internal uh, shocks within Europe. Let's start with the sort of external uh, shocks. One of the causes of the crisis was the subprime mortgage crisis, which started in 2007 in the United States and spread across Europe in 2008 and hit its highest point when the biggest U.S. banks collapsed. So I'd say that this crisis began because there was no balance. Uh, the American market was basically unbalanced, and also the monetary policy of the United States was short-sighted as well. And I hope that we won't see similar crises happening in future. Maybe this banking and financial crisis that led to the economic recession, at least in the big uh, countries, uh, in larger economies. Econ according to uh, economist Thomas Piketty, economic activity reduced by 50 percent, which basically meant that in, within two years' time, the world was hit by the largest recession since the Great Depression in the 1930s, and well, the Great Crisis of 1930s. And during the crisis, the unemployment in uh, Europe increased by 7 million unemployed and reached 10 percent mark or level. So this first wave of the crisis was followed by another wave of crisis, migration crisis. Uh, this time, we are facing, at the moment, a huge influx of the refugees from northern Africa, uh, Middle East, and sub-Saharan African uh, region, the region of uh, Africa, which was basically triggered, if you will, by the Arab Spring and the revolutions in Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya. So refugees began flowing from the south to the uh, north. And the number of refugees increased with every year. year. 1.7 million refugees came to Europe in 2013, the citizen of third countries. In 2004, it was 200,000 more, 1.9 million. And in 2015, it was 1.8 million. Most of those refugees are asylum seekers. Most of those asylum seekers are looking for safety uh, from the war in Syria, there have been 1.26 million Syrian refugees who've come to Europe over the period uh, of 
three years between 2011 and 2014. And the fifth number still rising in the first seven months of 2016, 665,000 refugees had fled to Europe. If you compare it to the same period in 2015, it is a bit more than 200,000 more. Uh, the year before figure was 434,000 refugees. And those more migrants are not relocated or resettled uh, evenly across Europe. They mostly first are accumulated at the border areas and then they try to get to Germany, the United Kingdom or France. So there's a very uneven dispersion of those uh, refugees among countries. And the third type of shock that we've seen is a security shock. New threats have emerged and uh, the peace and security in Europe is a threat and is undermined and we could basically draw th three circles around the European Union where you uh, can find the source of instability and the biggest circle and the farthest circle is where the area where the military and armed conflicts are taking place in Middle East and the Arab Peninsula. So those are basically armed conflicts that have uh, been also triggered or created by the 2011 Iraq and Syria uh, war. Now the second circle is very close to the European Union. We're talking about our neighborhood, the countries with whom we have a border or countries that are very close uh, with Europe. Ukraine, for example. Now the territorial integrity of Ukraine had been violated. It has lost a part of its uh, territory. Then there's also Turkey. Turkey that has uh, accommodated huge numbers of refugees coming from Syria or areas that have been affected by the war in Syria and where there is a very, very difficult situation in 2011. The Turkey has, is also struggling with Kurds and the political instabilities are also uh, having a toll on Turkey, especially after the coup that took place this March, this July, I'm sorry. And finally, the third circle could be drawn within the European Union because uh, Europe has been severely hit by uh, the Islamic terrorism. We could start mentioning them starting from the Terror Act in Madrid in March 2004 and uh, uh, London in July 2005. Those would be the first one. These attacks were attempts to deny our democratic rights. And this directly is an attack at the European project itself. Thus, uh, Europe has uh, faced a th three-layer attack, the, fin the financial, the migrational, and the security-related ones. It would be very simple to attribute this crisis to national states. And what I am talking about here is how our societies, how soci our societies are functioning currently. The subsequent crisis, sorry, the subsequent shocks are the ones that are coming from within the Europe. The first of which is the economic shock. Starting from 2010, the percent that were requested from several member states, so for bonds within the European Union uh, reached uh, very high figures. And this no longer reflected the macroeconomic situation. S we faced serious national 
debts and there were many speculations on financial markets as a result of which the European sorry the eurozone became uh, very fragile several criteria existed that no longer corresponded to good monetary zone requirements this meant that This showed that the political processes related to the introduction of a single currency were not well considered all the way through. The second endogenous shock, which might not be visible at the surface, at the face of it, is related to environment, uh, namely climate changes, which uh, the entire world faces currently. In the context of Europe, we see that uh, this topic, that is the environmental topic, is on the agenda. The Paris uh, Climate uh, Conference addressed this specifically, COP21 addressed this specifically, and countries are concerned about the current situation. States want to decrease uh, greenhouse gas emissions because uh, the present figures or the, f the present uh, uh, amounts are only tended to increase. If greenhouse gas emissions are not reduced, this will entail serious consequences. We will no longer be able to control climate change because uh, we might be threatened by the fact that if the planet's average temperature increases by two degrees compared to pre-industrial era. In t on April 22nd, 2016, the Paris Agreement was signed in New York. It was signed by 177 countries. The aim of this agreement is to strive to decrease greenhouse gas emissions. We also should talk about the next shock that is related to changes within the society itself. In France, we like to use the notion of economic Uberization. This comes from the notion of Uber, the American company's name. What we encounter is that the middle class uh, life expectancy increases and people still believe in progress this has been th this process or this uh, trend has so uh, existed for some 30 years however now the situation changes because borders have been opened migration rates have increased and we are facing problems that occur when migrants need to be integrated into the society. We also face the rise of xenophobia. Such changes in the society more often than not result in the fact that populists gain power. Also, whirlpool effects occur and and they are aimed at uh, fragmenting Europe into smaller pieces or or elements uh, examples uh, the Dutch referendum that took place on uh, the 6th of April in 2016 on the association agreement uh, between Ukraine and the e EU, as well as the British referendum on Brexit. 
the results showed that we were not ready to find out what people actually think. In fact, the trust or the faith of doing things together has uh, basically disappeared in the society. So this is how I have showed you that uh, three exogenous and three endogenous shocks have taken places. And they are all the foundations of the current modern crisis. This all generates the impression that the crisis is sort of multifaceted and very general in character. In order to solve this crisis, we need uh, uh, new instruments to tackle it. The international law that has uh, faced deep mutations, uh, profound mutations, uh, they have various links uh, to various uh, EU crises. International law cannot be neutral or operational. If this remains on the outside of the European crisis, it nevertheless can give rise to these uh, crises or make them worse. It can accompany these crises uh, or in turn, the, it can uh, uh, contribute to neutralizing these crises. Thus, what we need is to determine the dimensions of legal crisis in order to understand whether law can be attributed to any aspects of crisis or they could be instruments to solving crisis or in the opposite it can only make these cri they can only make these crises worse and uh, the birth of the international crisis law is not a one-off phenomenon. It is a logical outcome of a profound mutations of law that traditional international law faces. The various sectorial crises that I already touched upon can uh, be attributed or linked to legal problems and they directly impact the evolution of law. Since a law is an instrument for regulating social relations, special techniques need to be in place in order to control state policies, both in the international and international level. They can also serve as uh, instruments to guarantee uh, fundamental human rights, international rights, and law or rights in general that could uh, be uh, related to mechanical character of each sectoral type of crisis. This phenomenon does not have a, a homogeneous uh, character. This means that if we want to study uh, these conditions correctly, we need to solve these situations. In, ter in turn, the law can deform crisis conditions. They can actually make them worse or lengthier. Therefore, I will try to determine the uh, evolution or the manifestations of a modern crisis. Economic, in terms of economic and financial dimension, legal matters are related to the Europeani Europeanization of uh, uh, the uh, crisis. The, the economic and um, monetary policy development in Europe was uh, stopped or halted due to legal aspects several times. It was necessary to coordinate the, the processes between uh, local, national, and the EU. Uh, as we see in Pringle and Goweiler cases, uh, these, uh, uh, th this has served to solve uh, crisis later on, or at least they didn't um, worsen the crisis. However, nothing was clear from the very beginning. The role of law and lawyers has never been as important at the EU level as, uh, is as, as important as it has never been before. Law 
is no longer an external element in our security and economy. Currently, we suspect that law can actually work worsen crisis and uh, hinder the solution of crisis. As uh, the migration crisis has shown, we see that if we fail to understand correctly the subsequence and the consequences of events, then we might encounter difficulties, as we have seen in the case of the um, Dublin, as in the application of Dublin regulation. This has uh, made the political processes more difficult. Thus, I would like to mention that uh, fundamental rights protective instruments in the international law uh, work in uh, with very intrinsic or sophisticated or aspects and one needs to go into depth with uh, protection of human rights considering the different capacities and moments uh, of integration otherwise uh, these processes may be risky both at the member states level as well as at the EU level this is uh, one of the most uh, the, the highest aims of law in other words, to protect human rights. And finally, law cannot be taken away or viewed separately from the crisis that we can observe in the current society. Law increasingly frequently works with uh, sensitive matters uh, that exist in the society. Uh, ethics, family, minorities, bioenergies. Uh, the dynamics have increased greatly and currently they encounter, they witness both enthusiasm as well as opposition. All of this is related to people's understanding of the le legitimacy of this law. In this uh, situation, the legal society must be very uh, cautious. On the one hand, when we progress, we can, we can guarantee fundamental rights through deleting national particularities. On the other hand, Threats exist in relation to the fact that we might fall into increased or elevated co uh, conservatism. It is very difficult to balance these aspects and to choose the golden midway or the golden medium between these, ex uh, these um, tendencies. That's true now. Therefore, we need to understand that in the current situation, it is easy to create big differences between the national uh, approach to international law because the understanding or interpretation of the international law is damaged by political uh, parties and economic, political, social aspects of international law mean that the international law evolves along with a crisis depending on the socio-economic and political features of the uh, nation, of a nation. Uh, and thus, you know, those socio-economic uh, crises that uh, affect all the countries in the similar way may, may force us or may force us to think rather that we should create fundamental rights that eliminate basically any differences between the uh, different uh, countries. However, that does not mean that the, the, the fundamental principles should not evolve either because 
when those fundamental principles are challenged, uh, or if they are not rather challenged, we cannot uh, ensure uh, the adequacy of those international uh, laws. So we uh, quite often ask the advice of the lawyers, but people who seek such advice may also further interpret the legal advice given by a legal uh, expert. So uh, legal experts or legal community is not always heard on different issues. Now, international uh, law has gone through various phases of uh, transition, transformation, and, 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 and evolution. Crisis of international law may seem a strange statement uh, from me when the international law is basically blooming and developing, but I'm talking about uh, international uh, crisis as a timeless uh, phenomena, uh, and uh, I'm also uh, looking at the international law from uh, retrospective uh, view. So international law was aimed at decentralizing the power in the nation state. So international law has traditionally been developed at the national uh, level and then internationalized, if you will. So international law is developed uh, by the uh, judiciary, uh, which is one of the branches of the power in any country, and they develop those international laws to counter infrastate and superstate sources. So I'm talking in particular about multinational corporations, which are superstate sources. Their economic and financial weight is huge. The role is very prominent, so they have a direct influence on the development of various international uh, law, of different international law for different areas, international law, which is the basis for the market regulation. And there's a growing gap or mismatch between the power held by the multinationals and the power held by the state, or its government rather, having that power, they also have different ways or possibilities of influencing the markets, which is concerning. Governments are finding increasingly hard these days to maintain their sovereignty. They need to protect the fundamental rights and freedoms. They're obliged to do so which requires governments to be much more agile uh, and much more actively work in reconciling the public and private uh, interests. Now, the privacy on the Internet is a, an ambiguous issue. On one hand, you have the national interest, the state interest, and then the uh, privacy of an individual and need for the protection of the personal data. And this has led to the so-called soft laws that are actively uh, lobbied by the large multinationals or large uh, corporations. But even in less innovative countries, people are following very closely how uh, the securities or the protection of the uh, public uh, system or the society uh, are being enforced and how efficient they are. There are different evasive um, methods that are becoming increasingly intricate that are used by different public services in different countries when developing fiscal regulations and signing fiscal uh, agreements or, or making fiscal rulings. So there are some who are in favor of fiscal social dumping and even uh, permit uh, or uh, open doors to the abuse of those regulations and fraud as well. Therefore, international coordination or um, coordinating of international efforts uh, which is very poor at the moment, and the enforcement of uh, these laws, which is also at its low, um, uh, affects negatively countries and 
leads to poverty, such abuse of uh, fiscal legislation, uh, which uh, gives rise to a very aggressive, uh, greedy uh, globalization. No matter what which nation you prefer, soft law or hard law, nevertheless, there are some legal tools that are not entirely ethical and do not uh, support the values uh, upheld by our countries. And from a slightly different perspective, let me tell you this. The national, uh, super state, I'm sorry, sources of the international law do not weaken the countries in all instances. Uh, countries may increase their influence through super state sources because they're members of the international organizations and uh, they uh, follow the approaches of those international organizations uh, in uh, what they do. Uh, I would also like to underline that European uh, laws are very unique and interesting from the point of view of classical um, international law. European Union law is widely applicable. It covers uh, many areas. It's rather comprehensive law. Um, mostly the uh, European Union law deals with economy, environment, internal uh, issues, and so on and so forth. So, European Union law is based on the fundamental principles of the international law and the European uh, Union Charter of Fundamental Rights. It is also based on other international treaties signed by uh, different countries to protect their interests. What we can see is that the European Union law is all about the safeguarding of the fundamental uh, rights. The European Union and we can't basically draw a distinct line between uh, international courts and national courts. Uh, those two are linked together. Of course, you know, both of these courts have their uh, primary uh, functions, but they must also cooperate very closely when we, for example, can refer to Cardi one case. And this case has showed us that national courts cannot ignore the EU law national law uh, must be aware of resolutions that have been adopted by the UN Security Council, must take those resolutions into account. And that's the main difference that I see between the past international law and the international law of the present, of the present day, because we must take into account various bilateral dimensions uh, countries, uh, by joining together in various unions, have uh, attempted to expand their power, at least from the international law applicability uh, point of view. So before uh, that, uh, countries could, you know, decide uh, whatever they basically wanted. Now they have to follow international principles. Of, of, of international law. Now, different national legislation adopted by individual states cannot damage international law. It does not contradict with it. Let's take, for example, corruption. And the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act 
and the so-called foreign cubed cases. So this law or act adopted in 1977, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, is all about prosecution of foreign registered companies for crimes they've committed on in the United States. And then there's another act adopted during the First World War, the so-called Trade with the Enemy Act, and the second adopted in 1977, International Economic Emergency Powers Act. Those two, law, uh, those two laws, the intent of them was to enable imposed sanctions on countries or uh, companies registered in other countries that are either hostile to the United States or pose threat to the national security of the United States, its foreign or economic uh, policy. And the United States also, in 2010, adopted or passed the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, which stipulates the bilateral and multilateral obligations uh, and the uh, dispute resolution mechanisms for those. Let me also briefly touch upon the applicability of rights beyond certain uh, territories or outside borders. Of course, those rights are not unlimited. For example, the Keobel case when the U.S. Supreme Court had to decide the fate of a Nigerian citizen who have accused the Royal Dutch Petroleum of grave human rights violations. So the Supreme Court ruled that in this case they can't rule on the matter without explicit advice or instructions of uh, Senate. So we must also decide how countries follow the rules and the interest regulations or the legislation of another country to make sure that uh, when their citizens have violated fu fundamental rights cannot run to other countries and escape the punishment. On the other hand, international laws have the dimen economic dimension. Recently, with the advancement of the digital technologies, we've encountered new dilemmas. For example, Google versus Spain and Schrems case are some that I could mention in this regard. So we see that European Union awards courts rights to decide such cases and award uh, serious penalties. For example, uh, Apple case, Apple has been ordered to pay 13 billion euros so based on the claim uh, filed by the European Commission. This means that the in the EU, a sort of a hybrid model has emerged where national law coexists with international law. This means that one must 
have a very good understanding of how these this law interacts or these sides of law interacts in order to solve or or overcome contradictions and hindrances that uh, occur between these uh, legal regimes. When looking in this perspective, we understand that lawyers and judges, in other words, we have to be well aware of this legal pluralism and we have to refer to it constantly. This means that all the involved parties have to cooperate. We face globalization also at the level of law. We no longer can apply classic, classical international law models where a sort of uh, legal rights or a law pyramid exists or, where one level emerges into another. Now these levels merge and coexist and cooperate one with another or interact with each other. This means that uh, nowadays we especially need to pay attention to coordinating competences uh, we have to pay attention to homogenization and also we have to integrate legal decisions. We can do this by firstly and foremostly applying the subsidiarity principle. This is the key instrument that for coordinating such competencies. The European Human Rights Convention is especially based on the fact that some area or some space for maneuvering exists. What we are aiming at is we want to have a common understanding or unanimity of these 47 countries that form the European Council. Each of the member states have differing national legislation. This room or space for maneuvering can be smaller or larger depending on what matters are being discussed. Larger room for maneuvering could be left in matters related to general policy or relations between the state and religions or matters related to morality or bioethics. Here, national states have a larger say in this regard because that the European Council does not have a, a single sort of approach in, in this regard. However, countries or member states must strive to analyze their legislation and uh, try to link them to international legal norms. And this must be done systematically, but uh, it is expected from the European Human Rights Court to have a systematic approach. It is expected that uh, these uh, decisions or rulings uh, should be consistent or kept to a certain uh, kept in a certain uh, along a certain line so that countries know what to count on or what to expect the, the principle of subsidiarity which i touched upon is one of the key principles this means that uh, simultaneously we must have openness as well as consideration. This means that 
patient and careful or cautious dialogue between national and international courts must exist. Further on, in terms of coordinating competencies, I would uh, like to mention the rights or the law that uh, various institutions uh, protect. For example, national judges make sure that national legislation complies with international law. This is especially true for EU law as and the International uh, Human Rights Convention. For example, In France, we have a special uh, state council called Conseil d'État, which specifically works with such matters. And it strives to homogenize the law. This technique should be applied by all national judges. National judges cannot resolve everything without taking into consideration the international legal system. And this is where I would like to re refer to my own practical experience. For example, in France, an administrative court receives a complaint or, or an appellation on the, on the compliance of some kind of a ruling with the Constitution, then the national judge has to, dis, has to rule on this matter, particularly taking into account the EU legislation or laws. And if it is impossible, then uh, this should be referred to the uh, CJEU. After that, the judge, him or herself, can decide how constitutional and EU law can be apl applied to the claim. There should be no contradiction between national and EU law. For example, if we look at what judges do in Luxembourg, in the Court of Justice of the EU, then we see that the, the vast majority of their work is dedicated to resolve cases on how EU legislation should be applied. In turn, the Human Rights Court interprets how the Human Rights Convention should be applied, even though judges in Luxembourg and judges in Strasbourg work in different spheres. They still have identical aims. In other words, how to apply legal instruments or law. This does not take place automatically. The European Court of Human Rights can also reject a case if it can be reviewed at a national level. This uh, is uh, related to, say, claims filed by uh, asylum seekers. Uh, this needs to be resolved uh, applying the uh, Dublin regulation and this also is uh, the same applies uh, to sovereignty
courts can also um, impose the necessity or impose the claimant to refer to national courts. And this is where we can observe a very interesting development of events. For example, in the case of Avotinch versus Latvia, this is a very fresh case because the ruling was adopted in May this year. When national judges adopt decisions on even local legislation, it is not only about national legislation because judges also need to consider the case law and the experience of other courts. For example, in France, constitutional judges don't ask themselves what, what would uh, say legislation say regarding national legislation would say regarding this or that matter. Constitutional court wants to also know how would e the uh, Court of Justice of the EU look at it and what would the this court's opinion would be and what would Supreme Courts of other member states of the EU say as well as the Northern uh, American courts would say in in the particular matter. This is uh, not done in order to find what the majority would think and then to try to co coincide the opinion with the majority. It, it is on the contrary uh, aimed at adopting a more nuanced, a more detailed resolution or ruling. Considering that um, conditions of life are similar in various states uh, or member states, uh, and legislation is uh, similar from in one state and another, then it is uh, useful to simply find out what the rulings of other countries are. Thirdly, at the EU level, one must take into consideration how the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights is uh, observed. This charter must protect member states, uh, the, the fundamental rights of the member state citizens, uh, which uh, are also guaranteed by the constitutions of member states. What I can add here is that the, convergent, the convergence between the Court of Justice of the EU and the European Court of, of Human Rights that, that has become much more intense. Uh, the ruling in Ackenberg Franson's case um, is an example for this because then the Luxembourg's and Strasbourg's courts applied the same criteria. The the principle of an it bis in idem was applied. In other words, for oh, you do not uh, to the, the the same punishment. You cannot be punished by twice for the same, for one thing for one violation. This can also be applied to, in regard to the, the Court of Justice's ruling in Milani case. This means that member states can certainly apply their uh, legislation in uh, protecting basic rights or fundamental rights. However, however they do not prevail over the EU law, and if if contradictions arise, then national legislation must be amended.
L'homme apparaît moins évidente, pour ne pas dire incertaine, à la suite de l'avis rendu par la Cour de justice en décembre 2015. EU law, in all cases, or in all such cases, prevails over the national law. From a legal pluralism point of view, Europe needs more coordination or greater coordination between different uh, levels of uh, cons competence, harmonization and integration of different legal systems in order for Europe to be able to deal with the crisis it is facing at the moment. I'm absolutely certain that we'll face even more serious crisis in future. So we really feel that there is a tension between the constitutional identity and national sovereignty. Of course, we have to therefore respect the relationship between various legal systems or the links between various systems leading to various uh, frictions, uh, uh, misunderstandings, and lack of consensus, current international law crisis is actually the crisis of the national law and the pillars of the national law because there are uh, contradictions between uh, constitutional consistency or continuity and uh, uh, the sovereignty of the country, which leads to different risks. National constitutions and EU law have their differences, but uh, nevertheless, both uh, demand uh, respectful uh, treatment. For example, the Article 4 and 6 of the Treaty on the European Union and the Article 53 of the uh, Charter of uh, Fundamental Rights. Most of the EU member states have given a special status to the EU law, which puts them uh, at the same level as the constitutional uh, law. That, however, contributes to even more uh, contradictions between the national law and the EU law. For example, the case of Solange, the, the first and the second case, and the ruling of the German constitutional court uh, according to which a specific legal instruments are imposed to ensure the constitutionality of uh, uh, rulings uh, form uh, the basis for ensuring the protection of fundamental rights. So in other words, we can say that there are several member states that try to keep themselves in shape and try to align uh, their rulings or national legislation to the international law, in this case, the EU law. And that brings us back to the harmonization. Supreme Courts of different European countries are very vigilant. On 15th of December 2015, the Constitutional Court of one of the federal lands of, uh, of Germany confirmed the uh, comprehensive uh, jurisdiction of the European uh, law and has at the same time underlined that there are exceptions where national legislation with its unique identity can also be applied instead of applying the EU law. Another example is the FAM case. So this case is about the claims by the uh, 
And then there's the UK. Yes, the Parliament claimed about the sovereignty of the UK, which... So, ambiguous national uh, legislation can be considered a threat to the EU law. So, we must address those cases on an individual basis and then determine to what extent the EU law applies to a particular case. There must be a very clear division of functions between the national judges and the judges in Luxembourg so that both enjoy uh, appropriate autonomy, uh, decision-making autonomy primarily. Constitutional scrutiny is a very important function and has to be based or performed on the basis of the Maloney case. Just uh, uh, read, for example, Aranyosi and Calderar case, uh, which are the sort of follow-up cases to the Maloney case where uh, longer explanation on the applicability of uh, those laws is provided. So challenging of uh, sovereignty has indeed impeded transformation of national law. But if it doesn't contradict with the European integration, it doesn't mean that it doesn't contradict with anything because uh, with uh, uh, anything else, uh, because sovereignty uh, is something that uh, nations or states uh, care about, and it's a prerogative to them. Uh, so the European Union has a multitude of functions um, eloquently described in the Treaty uh, of the EU, so the EU basically deals within the scope of its competence. The European Union basically defines the frameworks or framework for its own action. The European Central Bank, for example, if we take monetary policy, can make certain decisions as provided by various treaties of the, the European Union, like, for example, in OMT cases. Uh, just uh, look at the Viola case. OMT is about the monetary policy. So any sentencing on such cases depends on the expert opinion of the European Central Bank has the key expert on the monetary policy. So German Constitutional Court has also made references to the European Court's ruling on the OMT and it has taken into account the ruling of the European Court of Justice, although it has sort of ignored or omitted some of the uh, circumstances in the case. So at the national jurisdiction, we have a certain constitutional scrutiny. However, it's very intricate or delicate, if you will. It's very soft. Uh, and for example, the ultra vires uh, scrutiny, which is performed by national courts based on national legal framework, leads to uh, other political dilemmas and may uh, push national legislation in further dissonance with the EU law and therefore lead to conflicts between judges and leaders of the political parties and leaders or leadership of the European Union. So when ruling, we must constantly remember about our security and the stability in our neighborhood. So that's why we've developed special guidelines on how 
to act in these cases, or a protocol, if you will. So we can't rule on the basis of the isolation or autocratic principles. We must follow very carefully uh, the fundamental rights. And same applies to the periphery of Europe, those countries that are further from the center of Europe. We cannot stop the development of fundamental uh, rights in its tracks, no matter what, uh, despite uh, the difficult discussion uh, needed to reach a consensus. So we must uh, revaluate national identity and uh, sovereignty vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, the European Union and uh, further integration or ever closer uh, union. And uh, we must also reassess or reevaluate the role of the judges both at the national and international uh, level at solving one of uh, the pressing challenges. Finding ways, uh, or in other words, finding ways of, of, of applying international law to solve the current crisis. That doesn't mean that we are uh, going to erase national identities or peculiarities of national law legislation. Nevertheless, we must create a very dynamic relationship between the national and European law, the one that would contribute to the further integration of the uh, European Union and provide for a sovereignty of the countries. We must basically follow the ideals of the European Union or Europe. So thank you very much, Mr. Sewer. You gave a, an excellent presentation, and, 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 and it seems that you know you gave us all the necessary advice and guidance we needed. There are basically no questions as to what should I do now. You gave us very specific answers as to what needs to be done in the nearest and midterm, medium, or longer uh, future. So, uh, if you want, uh, and if you have any questions or comments regarding Mr. Sowe's uh, uh, presentation and speech, feel free to ask them now, because we now open the floor for questions. And I do suppose that a lot of interesting questions have been provoked in your mind. Yeah, it seems that we need, just need to work further. And Mr. Sauvé is saying that if there are no questions, then either everything is clear or nothing is clear. Yes, uh, let me make a couple of uh, remarks, if I may. I would like to emphasize uh, the role of uh, lawyers and judges. Indeed, what you said is very interesting. In the beginning of this conference, we had a discussion with the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Latvia. It was an, indeed a very interesting discussion because he said that uh, he said more or less the same things that you did. He said that he trusts lawyers and judges, and that uh, during this era of crisis, which you referred to as a constant crisis. The role of lawyers and judges becomes increasingly important. This is my first comment. My second comment is related to the constitutional pluralism. Perhaps we touched upon this matter very slightly and very shortly during this conference. However, constitutional pluralism is a value in itself. We must find a way how to manage this pluralism at uh, the European as well as the international level. 
Certainly, I must mention the International Society. These are the three things that I wanted to mention after your speech. We have uh, the duty of convergence at the national and international level. These are my comments. Are there any questions? Thank you. My name is uh, Andreas Ziegler from the University of Lausanne. I would like to use the opportunity to ask you a question. There are quite a few participants here that deliver lecture, international law lectures at universities. My question is as follows. How do you see the responsibility of a lecturer in international law? And also, do lecturers have to challenge these crises, or do they have to be taken into account while delivering lectures? Mr. Sauvé, this is a very broad question. When I talk about the responsibility of the legal society or community, I talk about judges, but I also talk about scholars, and scholars, obviously, are lecturers. I mean, I think of all the professions within the realm of law. We shouldn't address these matters uh, to lightheartedly. I think that we shouldn't be pessimistic. However, we must be realistic. We shouldn't attempt to pretend that the situation is better than it is. At the same time, this doesn't mean that we should only cry and complain and claim that there's nothing that can be done and that everything is in a terrible situation. You can always do something. And I think that the responsibility of lecturers or staff or faculty is very, very large. I have studied international law and actually, I fear to tell you when I did that. It was actually in 1960s. I must say that the foundations that were laid while I studied international law have changed. Nevertheless, this is not a reason to give up these foundations. We have to use these foundations to build on, to build on a new understanding or comprehension of international law. Therefore, academic personnel or faculty plays a crucial role. For example, I would encourage uh, master students to develop uh, various possible future scenarios. I personally believe in the future of the EU. However, we will not be able to construe this future of the EU by denying the sovereignty of uh, member states and their constitutions. We have to take into account all of the factors that form or shape this future of the European Union. We have to be very responsible. During my speech, I, I mentioned various uh, rulings, the Pringles case, the, the Galweiler case, the general federal court case, and I also touched upon other case, cases. I think that this only confirms 
that a serious dialogue is emerging or evolving among member states and it speaks volumes of the fact that member states are becoming highly responsible. We were able to witness this especially in OMT cases. We cannot view everything by saying that yes the EU court won and the constitutional court lost. In this perspective or from this point of view, you cannot look at things. You have to have a dialogue between legislations and law. Also, during my speech, I chose to touch upon Germany as opposed to France. You know, initially I had uh, very many references uh, to France, but later on, as I developed my speech, I deleted them to avoid speaking about France too much. Finally, I ended up choosing to talk about Germany. However, this doesn't mean that uh, among 28 member states, uh, Germany acquires a special status. All countries are equal. I just wanted to show that uh, one shouldn't jeopardize the future uh, or threaten the future of the European Union. Are there any other questions? Europe on minority rights and he said well you know there are some things going on but it's no problem because we have the court in Strasbourg and I was wondering because you talked about all the shock exogen and everything which comes in um, how long can courts constitutional courts the Strasbourg court um, hold a wave of populism a wave which might not be in conformity of our idea of Europe. And if, I mean, could be that, you know, until the judges have to go and there are new judges, um, it will be the case that they uphold human rights, that they have this kind of conversation the, um, between the courts. But what if you have a constitutional court which is nominated, or the new judges are nominated by a populist government. What do you do? What will we be doing? And this is my great fear, because the economic problems in Europe are comparatively small. The big problem is the politics. And I think this is where we are failing, and I don't know what to do. And I'm terribly afraid, I have to say. Oui. Alors, une autre question, mais j'ai bien entendu, madame, euh, ce que vous... There, there's another question uh, there. Uh, madame, I understood your uh, question. Hello, I am a judge of the Lithuanian Constitutional Court. I didn't want to say anything. However, my question were to be accurate. My comment would be as follows. Currently, we have many systems. We have the European system, the, the Human Rights Court, and we have the national system. And I completely agree with you, Mr. Suve, regarding your conclusions. However, the problem lies in the fact that you said that we must listen to each other. Certainly, we must listen to each other. However, constitutional courts differ from one member state to another. One member state differs from to another. Let me give you an example. We had very good relations with the Polish constitutional court. And last year, we had a very interesting conference. This year, we invited the Polish Constitutional Court to a conference that took place in Lithuania, and they could not 
visit this conference because uh, they were too busy. The, the burden of the bulk of work was, was too big on them. So my question is, how do we tackle this dialogue? Because sometimes the constitutional court has a hard time doing something. Yes. This is where you basically hit the bullseye, so to speak. You very well understand the key problem. You understand very well how a situation where a constitutional court is uh, prolonged or, or it is hindered and how dialogue can take place between Strasbourg and Luxembourg courts as well as member states. Many of you might be surprised, but when I talked about the development of fundamental rights and that we need a highly nuanced, detailed approach, I actually had the same concerns that you did. At the European level, we need to clearly state or, or show that we disagree to amendments that are not acceptable. And this is where I mean the solely the political level. We cannot just work with the tiny details or fragmented things. The current equilibrium might be jeopardized in the future because we are witnessing very high pressure, the time of very high pressure, we have two very large courts, one in Luxembourg, one in Strasbourg. And currently, these courts work with cases or matters that they did not have to work with during the time when the a pro protocol 14 needed to be ratified. How the court court worked very slowly at that time. About 1,500 cases were waiting for rulings to be adopted. The question is, how do we keep up the European ideal? We have to be cautious. We should refrain from positioning that people might understand. I'm not saying, I'm not talking about the fact that only lawyers need to understand what uh, we're talking about. The, what courts say, people should be able to understand what courts say. Courts cannot only address lawyers. I see that uh, our discussion is carrying on and our conference could carry on and on. However, the President of the Republic of Latvia is expecting to meet Mr. Sauvé. I would like to thank you once again for your speech for arriving in Riga and for the fact that you accepted the invitation that you received from ESSEL. Thank you, Mr. Sauvé. I would also like to thank all of you for taking part in this conference. And let us give a round of applause to the speaker. This is, this book is uh, meant for you.